seminar series. We're so glad you're here. Now, you all remember what the purpose of this seminar series is, correct? This series is the series that's designed in order to bring innovators to us so that as we listen to the places in which they're working in the innovative space, we think about how it applies to what we do. And so in the exchange that happens from them with us and with, from us with them ends up enriching us all. These partic this particular seminar series is designed not to be a, a particular discipline within our space. So it's designed that whether you're a ISC or you're a, or a EE or you're a mechanical or you're a biological or a biomedical engineer or any of the things that we do as a civil, anything that we are, you're going to be able to gain something out of listening to this particular talk and engage it. And so think and feel free probably near the end to ask questions or he'll direct how he wants to ask questions, but this is really for all of us and it is for that exchange. I want to introduce the speaker to you. Um, it is my pleasure to welcome Bill Starling to the college. He is the Managing Director of Synergy Life, Science Partners, and Chief Executive Officer of Cinecor. That's a business generator and financial incubator of new medical device companies that's based in the Research Triangle Park area. However, he's lived in Silicon Valley since 1982. So he calls back and forth, and he was just saying that he was there for the game, and is a little disappointed because he wanted to go the other way. So uh, uh, that just passed this weekend. But he spends about four months each year at RTP. As the CEO of Cinecor, Starling helped co-found several companies. And there's a long list that you would have seen on his abstract. So just to give you some example, Barrow Sense Incorporated, uh, Interpulse Incorporated, Transenteryx Incorporated, Interventional Autonomics uh, Incorporation, and the list goes on. And so we're talking about an innovator who sees the opportunities that are before us and actually acts on them. And so I think as we listen to him, there's going to be quite a bit that we're all able to gain from his, his seminar. He'll discuss challenges and innovative solutions in the high technology medical device industry. In particular, he will share how clinical needs in the cardiovascular disease field have led to proprietary cost-effective clinical solutions that rely on expertise from numerous engineering disciplines and beyond our engineering disciplines. From his seminar, I believe we will all get a glimpse into how good ideas, because you know, good ideas are not enough, and how funding, and even how regulatory, are linked in order to shepherd innovations from the conception stage to clinical practice. So please, everyone, join me in welcoming Bill Starling <clears throat> to the college. Thank you, Dean. It's a pleasure to be here in uh, Greensboro. Um, I was um, born and raised in Raleigh and have uh, been, had the good fortune of, at age 22, took a one-way trip from Chapel Hill to Los Angeles, or Hollywood, actually, to go to business school, and that changed my life. Um, it's been a really fun uh, journey, and I'm here. I'm showing you here the picture of my bedroom. This is, this is, this is the Windy Hill in uh, Palo Alto, California right behind, beside Stanford University here. So every day I wake up and see this incredible view of the coastal mountains of California. Um, the Stanford University campus is kind of the mecca of, of med tech innovation. When I got there in 82, it's been 33 years ago, yesterday I moved there, as it turns out, on March 8th, two days ago. Um, there was only four or five med tech companies in, in Silicon Valley. Now it is, it is worldwide number one by far. And all that's happened in the last 33 years. I want to share with you some of the some of the things that have occurred in my life that have made um, transformational differences in, in cardiovascular medicine in particular. So, uh, pleasure being here in Greensboro. Uh, I spent a lot of time here as a young boy. My uh, two aunts and uncles are here, and cousins. So I'm here quite a bit. I was in fact here Sunday seeing my aunt Betsy, who's 89 years old. So, what I want to talk today about is the agenda shown here. Um, talked about less invasive intervention in coronary disease. That is, bypass surgery was the, the gold standard 40 years ago. Now there's uh, catheter-based therapy. It's a lot less invasive, and I'll take you through the journey of how that occurred uh, in my early career. And then, in that regard, I'm going to talk to you about the, the historical parts of coronary angioplasty. My first startup called ACS, or Advanced Cardiovascular Systems. 
and BVS is, uh, is, a, is a current uh, therapy about to be introduced in the U.S. Am I? No. Oh, I'll drop my, uh, my, my baton here. <laughs> Little things happen. Yeah. Thank you. So, yeah, so the, uh, the company BVS is the future of coronary intervention. And uh, that will be, 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 be very cool because I know you guys have a big program here and, uh, and bioerodible bio uh, metals as well. So then I'll talk more about the current environment in MedTech in the Silicon Valley and here and then challenges uh, facing us. And then if we have time, I've got an hour, I believe, Dean, right, uh, one hour. So if we have time, I'll go into my, my most current company, which is now doing cases today in the U.S. for the first time in humans in Detroit. So um, I've, I've been around a long time. Um, I mentioned my journey from uh, Chapel Hill to, uh, to Los Angeles. And then I got involved with this startup called uh, ACS um, that was acquired by uh, Lilly in 84. Uh, and that was the first company to pioneer coronary angioplasty with a movable guide wire. I'll talk about that. And then I started a company called Ventratex, which was the first company to pioneer microprocessor controlled implantable defibrillation, a Silicon Valley uh, company that went public in 19. 92, and now it's part of St. Jude Medical. It's about $2 billion a year business for St. Jude Medical. And then um, my third company was Cardiac Pathways as CEO. I took it from seed investment to a public offering in 96, and then we were acquired by Boston Scientific in, 19, in 2001. So my journey from Chapel Hill to LA to Irvine, where Edwards was, to Palo Alto all occurred in my 20s. So by the time I was 42 years old, I was able to take a, com a company public and uh, that was kind of quite a journey from, for me publicly. Uh, so uh, since then, I've been involved in 2000s with Cinecore, and since we've formed this company, which has partners that include Medtronic, Johnson Johnson, uh, uh, Abbott, and Boston Scientific, we've been able to generate about uh, these companies here from Barisense all the way to Neurotronic here. So these companies here are currently what we have produced, and one of them was a, was a public company uh, which is called Transenteryx. That's a robotics company and, and RTP. And I'm currently the unpaid CEO of both uh, uh, Aegis and Atrius, which is in structural heart disease, which I'll, I will talk about later on in this talk. So in today's market, if you look at heart disease, you have two basic areas. You've got electrical disease, which is shown on the right here, pacemakers, defibrillators, and, and ablation, if you will, for dysrhythmias. And on the left side, we have a plumbing problems, which is served with angioplasty, stents, and heart valves. So I'm going to talk about this primarily today in my talk. So I'm showing you today a, a internet website of the world's first coronary intervention with a balloon catheter uh, that goes into the leg to the coronary arteries of the heart. This is the actual lesion here. You see the, the plaque build up here in the artery. And the blood flow is diminished through that narrowing. As a result of it, the patient can feel ischemia or heart chest pains. And so to resolve this, typically you would have open heart surgery prior to 1977. This is the first patient that was ever intervened upon by a balloon catheter. And an angioplasty, or PTCA it's called, a, a, a guide wire is sent across the lesion where the narrowing occurs, where the plaque occurs. A balloon catheter is blown up and flow is reestablished, therefore avoiding having to have open heart surgery. This was the world's, world's first patient done in 77. You see the before and after results here. And this was a revolutionary change in the treatment of heart disease. Uh, I happened to be at ground zero at that point as a marketing manager for a big company, Edwards, trying to find a way to participate in balloon angioplasty. So my job was to write a business plan to deal with this innovation and see if we could participate, uh, be a big player in this market. Uh, the pioneer was Andreas Grunzig, and he believed that the movable guide wire was not necessary. He believed in a fixed guide wire catheter that would address the majority of the lesions that were in the proximal part of the heart. So our idea was to have a, a guide wire that moved independently from the fixed balloon catheter and go to many parts of the heart. 
Does anybody here drink wine? Okay. Okay. There you go. Great. I'm the wine guy, the top left guy here, especially. So you know how you, when you have a, a, a corkscrew, it, it looks like this, right? You, you put that into the wine bottle to take the cork out. Well, coronary arteries kind of mimic that because you find that some of the arteries kind of do this, and you can't put a thick guide wire catheter across the lesion. It will not go down very far before it hits the, the wall and stops. So our innovation was at ACS was to put a guide wire down the, the artery, even though it was a uh, corkscrew type anatomy, get the wire down first and then follow with the balloon catheter. Sounds simple, but that was what made AC, ACS successful. As a result of it, um, when we got FDA approval in 82, the movable guide wire market became a real market. If we had not had that innovation, we never would have had the growth in angioplasty that occurred in the mid-80s. So, <clears throat> so ACS was indeed Camelot. We had the situation in which we took a company that was, uh, when I got there in March 8th of 82, there was no FDA approval, there was no venture capital financing, it was, it was bootstrapped by seed capital only. And within two months here, we were able to get FDA approval and venture capital funding, and as a result of it, we were able to, to fuel the growth of our company, as shown here. So I left in 85 to start another company called Ventratex, but at that point, it was clear to me that we were going to be very successful, but I wanted to do something different than be part of Lilly at that point. So this was a very incredible experience. The income before taxes was uh, very, very high. We had made our milestone payments. As it turns out, I'm going to show you now a, a, a cap table showing the success of it financially. But essentially, we were sold to Lilly in, in May of 1984. So two-thirds of the money was given to us in Lilly stock, and a third of the stock was held back in a lockbox that basically was dependent upon our uh, revenue and income before taxes I just showed you. So we made 29 thirtieths of the earnout. And if you were to look at that in today's dollars, it'd be about a $2 billion uh, acquisition. So that was the first real mega hit in Silicon Valley for MedTech. And I was fortunate at age 28 to 31 to be part of that experience. So um, the investors did very well here. This is a, not to be an eye chart here, but if you look here at the early money into it, if you came into ACS before there was any, any known knowledge of success, you had a 55x return on your capital. If you came in a little bit later, you still did 28x return on your capital. If you were the first venture money in here, you, you did a 14x return within two years. This is all, these are all very good returns. So this is an example of how an investor or an employee through stock options benefits from the success of a startup company. Again, this is ACS and Silicon Valley. So when this occurred, in, uh, it was announced in the Wall Street Journal in uh, March of 84. We were at the American College of Cardiology in New Orleans, which is the best party town in the world. Anybody been to New Orleans before? It's a great, great place. So we were at New Orleans, and we decided to go out and have one big party. And this is what happened. We got drunk as hell. We had a great, great time here. This is me, a young product manager. This is our, one of our founders back here. These two guys here. Anyway, we went out and had a big blast here. But we were the first, again, success story in that era. So that's the history of how coronary intervention began in the late 70s, early 80s, mid 80s. And so a lot's happened since then. And I'm not sure if anybody here has had relatives have had uh, stents put in or balloon angioplasty, but probably I'm sure many of you have had or know people that have had that happen. But this is the future of uh, coronary intervention. So when you put a balloon catheter in the artery, it blows up, and often about a third of the time it re-narrows. It's called restenosis. So to put another catheter back in after six months is a, is a problem, but it's still doable. But there's been a lot of uh, innovation in trying to reduce that re-intervention problem. And stents, which is a metal, a metal scaffold, if you will, was put in there to, to keep the artery from re-narrowing. That's called stents. Now, BVS is a company that we started at, at Center Corps in 2002 and 3. This is the plaque you just saw earlier. Uh, balloon catheter goes in. There is a, a stent that is left behind, in this case, a, a 
a polymer stent that biodegrades over time. So if you can imagine, um, if you have a broken arm, you put a cast on your arm, right? And then after six weeks or eight weeks or two months, whatever, you take the cast off once the inflammation is done and, and the healing occurs. And the inflammation of the artery here, there's no reason to leave a metal stent behind because if you do, you can have a, 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 a bad embolic event occur to causing a heart attack. If you, have a metal, if you have a metal stent, it's there forever. If you have a plastic stent, it biodegrades over time, which is what BVS does. It will biodegrade into carbon dioxide and to, and to water. And the FDA, because it does biodegrade, and there are materials that have been approved by the FDA in the past, they're cool with having, having this go forward and be improved here. So this stent is approved in, in 60 uh, countries worldwide, but not the U.S. It will be approved here within about six to nine months. But it's a big innovation because, it, again, if you have the, uh, a inflammation of your artery here and you were to have it cured within about six to eight weeks, which is what occurs with a stent, then there's no reason to have a metal stent in your artery. Um, another, another major uh, advantage is if you do have multiple stents put in, metal stents, and you try to get imaging done, with uh, an MRI or CT even, you can't really see very well. The plastic stent, because it's gone, does not have that problem. And finally, if you have a, a full metal jacket of, say, many, many stents, uh, like, a, like a three or four in a row down your main artery, the Widowmaker artery, the LAD, you cannot go back in there and do surgery later because it's just too much metal to compete with. So as a result of it, the plastic stents the polymer stents that we're going to be coming out in the next year, this year, will be probably the preferred uh, stent of choice going forward. And this all occurred in our animal lab in RTP. We did N of one pig, and Guidant was able to buy us, now Abbott Labs, to buy us and take it forward as a, uh, a structured deal that I'll just discuss in a minute. But the stent has been in such popular uh, literary uh, successes as these two journals here, but Essentially, it was a structured deal in which we at Senecor decided that we could do a venture financing and do well with this company, we think, but more than likely it was going to take a long, long time and a lot of money. Therefore, Guidon was willing to step up and buy it from us in a staged, structured way. So they, they paid um, uh, six milestone payments. Five have been paid to date. Six is coming up next, uh, next summer, this summer. It's, it's entrepreneurship in which we advised them how to make this work and then they, in turn, took it forward with their own money and their own R&D and clinical success. And uh, it was approved in Europe in 11. And then they stopped enrollment in the U.S. study about a year ago. This will, this will be uh, on the market again in the next uh, six months, we think, in the U.S. So if you have anybody that needs a stent, tell them to go to Abbott. Um, now, iRhythm is a company that is not a Cinecor company. It's an uh, investment that we made at my venture fund, Synergy. And uh, iRhythm is a company that looked at a big unmet need at Stanford Bio Biodesign about seven years ago. And so if you're familiar with Stanford Biodesign, they basically get together uh, teams of about three or four people. And they have about four of these teams. And they go into the Stanford Medical Center and spend about a month and a half looking at what's going on in the hospital. I tell you to figure out what is inefficient, what can be done better, it can be done cheaper, it can be more cost effective. Uh, it can be a big technology breakthrough like I just showed you with a, with a, with a polymer stent, or it can be very simple. In this case, iRhythm is a very simple concept. What it is, they looked at the uh, people that have dysrhythmias, people that have uh, uh, they pass out, they have shortness of breath, they have uh, unexplained syncope, and they don't know why their heart is not working right. So they put this Holter monitor on. As you see here, these multiple patches on the front and back of the body, and they wear them for like 24 to 48 hours. Well, then these, these recordings in this little box here um, are then given to a cardiologist who looks at all these, these strips of uh, EKGs that could go from here to the front, uh, front door and back easily for 24 hours. So rather than having to look at every single EKG and de determine which of these bad arrhythmias were occurring during that 24 or 40 hour period, we invented a way to put a patch on the heart. And this patch here, it's called a Zeopad, 
is, is worn uh, on top of the heart for, for 14 days. And it records every single EKG event and gives the doctor a report. So he can see that there was a, a atrial fibrillation occurrence that occurred on day eight for these 10 minutes here. And it can summarize the reports here. So this, this innovation was very interesting because we disrupted a, a $1 billion market that had not changed in 30 to 40 years overnight with one clear innovation that occurred by a bunch of students who were in their mid to late 20s. Uh, today, this company is about to go public. <laughs> uh, I'm on the board. I'm an investor. I've been involved from day one. Uh, but it has currently a $140 million type valuation and has a, has a world-class group of investors that have taken it to the point now where we're uh, projecting profitability within a year. So when I, joined, when I got involved here, it was a, it was a Stanford Biodesign project. We had a, a patent pending, no claims, a provisional patent at Stanford Tech Transfer. Got involved in getting that deal done, brought in a CEO. And then we've gone through a number of changes. The biggest has been reimbursement challenges. When we started the company in 06, 07, we thought that once you got it approved by the FDA, it would be an obvious no-brainer and a successful company. But we had to deal in the recent years with CMS for reimbursement. So rather than saying, okay, now that we've got a code for reimbursement, we now have to negotiate with all these payers. And they're big and small everywhere, but these payers are demanding that we get through peer-reviewed publications that show the cost effectiveness of our device, the Zio patch versus Holter monitoring. And that took us about three years and a lot of money to get through all this. The game changed, we had to react to it, and we've been successful to date in getting coverage. Now we have uh, over 240 million covered lives in America, which is a lot of, a lot of people. So now, if you do have a, a, pay, a parent or a relative or yourself that has some type of dysrhythmia problem here, you can go to this hospital, you can go to, to Moses Cone Hospital and get this done today. It's a pretty cool invention. But this is an example of, um, of innovation that's a simple idea. I'm not now going to shift my talk to talk a little bit about, about challenges in fundraising for med tech companies. Um, I mentioned to you before ACS, we were able to get through our uh, journey with mostly borrowing from Lilly post-acquisition at E4, but we did raise about $9 million of venture capital. So we were able to do that successfully with a little bit of money back in the early 80s here. And since then, there's been a lot of change, primarily in the regulatory and reimbursement uh, areas. Ventratex, again, the world's first microprocessor-controlled implantable defibrillator, we were able to compete against Medtronic and Lilly and beat them to market after four years and 11 days, first in man implant. It's really amazing. And what it took us a lot of time and money, 40 million of venture capital, uh, an IPO of $70 million, and then a secondary offering of $43 million to finance that through to, to be self-sufficient and therefore profitable. My third company, uh, the ablation company that I ran, Cardiac Pathways, we had to raise $35 million in venture capital, IPO of $40 million, uh, $48 million in '96, and then we had to do a, a private investment as a public company going forward to be successful. So these are, these are giant, giant amounts of money to raise, and it's this kind of amazing thing about it. I mean, if I'm with, if I'm with one of your students here and looking at this, I'm like, how do you, how do you raise that kind of money? And it's, it's very hard to do. Uh, it's even harder now than it once, once was. Believe me, it's a lot more difficult now. And the reason it changed in the 80s was the, what I call the Kessler, the Kessler effect. Uh, David Kessler was the FDA uh, commissioner back in the um, 80s, and he wanted to have uh, medical device trials look more like drug trials. And as a result here, they, they, they basically uh, regulated us to have very big clinical trials that are randomized and with controlled, uh, controlled experimental arms that were very expensive to do. So the, the uh, IDE is the investigational device exemption to get started with human clinical testing in the U.S., for, for balloon angioplasty and ACS, it only took us about five quarters to get from initial approval of the IDE to the pre-market approval of the PMA. Whereas in Ventratex, the, again, the implantable device for sudden cardiac death survival uh, victims, 
it took us about you know, almost 20 quarters, so a lot longer. And as you, as you move down the continuum of high burn rates, it's very, very, very difficult to finance that unless you have some near-term liquidity event in sight, i.e. an acquisition or an IPO. By contrast, um, if you look at my career mentor is a guy called Dr. Thomas Fogarty, who invented the world's first embolectomy catheter uh, back in 50-some years ago. When, when Tom invented this catheter, he was in his 20s. It took him two months from invention to get to first clinical use. It took him $1,800 for patents and time of materials. By contrast, if you look at TAVR, which is a transaortic valve replacement with a catheter system, it took Edwards and Medtronic over $2 billion in 14 years to get to market. Most of that was the FDA regulations that were uh, meant to improve safety and efficacy in the U.S., but in fact caused the innovation to occur outside the U.S. as these procedures have been improved now early in Europe, but not in the U.S. Um, this chart here is from the FDA. Uh, I went to a talk a few months ago in Palo Alto, where I live, and uh, this is a really interesting topic because the FDA is aware that their policies have inhibited innovation in America for medtech. Most medtech innovations occur in very small companies that aren't under 10 people. Uh, my current company, Aegis, that I'm running now for instructional heart disease, we, only have, we have no employees. We have about six or seven contractors. And again, it's based in Ireland, but we have a very small company, but we're changing the way aortic valve disease is treated, and I'll talk more about that in a minute. It's very, very interesting. Um, and as a result of the uh, problems in innovation in America here, much of the innovation that we used to see in the 80s and 90s now is going overseas. Uh, the, this blue line here shows you the number of companies receiving capital the private investments from venture capitalists primarily, and it's gone way down from the heyday back in the 80s and 90s. Uh, what we saw there in 2008, of course, was a credit crisis, and as a result of poor venture capital returns, too much money in venture capital for medtech, uh, the FDA continuing to be difficult to deal with and being very unpredictable, and then reimbursement hell coming through the CMS reimbursement payers system. That all caused venture capitalists to flee the medtech environment to other more safer uh, investments. So my son is, uh, my youngest son is 22 years old, 23 now. He got out of Berkeley in, uh, in May. He's a business major there at the Haas School of Business. And he's in an internet marketing company in San Francisco. And they uh, sell furniture uh, over the internet. Now, that's where money's going. They've got series A and B by two well-known venture capitalists, and uh, their valuation is over $100 million. And they almost failed after their second pivot. They had a third pivot, which worked out for them. So the venture capitalists are saying, why put money into med tech when I can put money into Dot and Bow <laughs> and have a healthy outcome? So unfortunately, the way the world works today is that uh, these venture capitalists do not have a, dic uh, you know, a, a dictate to put money into med tech. They have a dictate to make money for their limited partners. They don't care if it's in furniture over the internet or saving lives through coronary stent or uh, structural heart disease. So that is the reality of where things are today in um, the world of med tech here. So we're having to deal with that and do things more, uh, uh, a lot more different, uh, differently than we did before when we had access to, to unlimited venture capital. So, and the FDA, again, is aware of this, and they're, they're trying to change their behavior right now. Um, so if you look at this slide here again from the FDA, they recognize this, and they say, okay, if you have an eight-week week delay in, in scheduling a meeting, it, it will talk, cost the average startup company here a million eight. If you have uh, this request to do another animal study for whatever reason, then it could cost you, you know, five and a half million dollars. And then go on and so on. If you have a, uh, another request to do another clinical study, it can cost you tens of millions of dollars. So this is causing people like me to say, why should we start companies in America when we can start them in Europe and do things overseas and then get to a, a point in which a big company can do a structured deal with us like Biostent 
and get liquid rather than have a, us, us having to face all the perils of financing a very difficult environment here in the U.S. as a sole strategy. Make sense? So anyway, um, so again, the FDA is aware of this, they're trying to change, you know, but the government is a the government, they, they don't move very quickly. Um, the, the top uh, management of the FDA is bought into change. It's the bottom part that doesn't really want to change. So we're having to try to move a very big ship like a Titanic away from the iceberg, and it takes a long, long time. So, um, but I'm very happy to, to tell you that the top, top management of the FDA is in tune with what, what I'm just talk, talking about here, because these are their slides. Sorry. Yes. Um, Hi, Steve. What sorts of things could the FDA do? I mean, if, if the top people have an idea of the change, do they have a sense of what change they would actually do? Yeah, they're, they're trying to, um, I'll give an example, they're trying to bring first-in-man studies back into the U.S., and they have a program in which you can apply to do a, a quick start study for human investigation in the, in the U.S. Uh, rather than seeing yet another study go overseas and have initial reports done there. And that is just now about a year old, and it's, it's, some, it's somewhat successful, but not greatly successful. There's still a lot of low-level bureaucrats that don't want to have uh, don't want to accept, accept a study in the U.S. that may cause them to look bad. In other words, if they were, they were to kill somebody in their, in their clinical study here and they approved it and they're on the front page of the New York Times the next day, it's, that's not good. So they're, they're, the, the, the pendulum is going from highly risk averse to more patient friendly, but it's, it's, it's taking a long time to get the pendulum to go back to the center of the, 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 of the stage here. Anyway, it's, you know, um, you know, it's government. You know, how do you, how do you change government? This is difficult. So anyway, so uh, we're going to talk about TAVR, which is a transaortic valve replacement with a catheter-based system here. So this, this took place outside the U.S. Uh, first in man was in France many years ago, and it took four years to get approval in the U.S. I'm sorry, in the uh, Europe, the C mark. And it, we were the 43rd country to approve TAVR. Can you imagine that? Here we are, the, we invented it, we, we designed it, we made it, we tested it overseas, got in Europe, everybody, everybody, everybody was using generation three and four, and the U.S. just approved it about two years ago. And this is a, this is a, a disease called uh, aortic stenosis, AS. Critical AS is, uh, has a death curve the same as pancreatic cancer. If you get this disease, you will die, <laughs> probably in about two years. So it's a disease for the elderly in their 80s typically, 70s, 80s, 90s. And if you get this disease here, you will die if you don't correct it. And the problem is if you're 85 years old and have poor heart function, to have open heart surgery may be your death knell. So if you can do a less invasive procedure to put a valve in with a transcatheter procedure and walk out the next day or two or three, then that's a much better outcome, right? So that's called TAVR. But again, it was, it, you know, $2, million, $2 billion was spent by each of these companies here to get to the market. So I'm just going to just uh, go through these very quickly, talk to you about some general surveys that kind of validate my points about the uh, excessive regulation is causing an adverse effect on innovation in our country. So uh, the, the, sh the red bar here shows that the biggest concern is the FDA. If you're looking at uh, investing money in medtech, this is the biggest concern. Again, medtech and biopharma, big concern with high, re high FDA regulation. Healthcare IT, on the other hand, is like the Zeo patch is healthcare IT for the most part. That one has almost no impediment from the FDA, and it's done very well. The same point here about VCs are just saying we're, we're not interested in putting money in the medtech today because we have other ways we can make money that doesn't have the excessive regulation and time delay and uncertainty. Uh, the survey done by about 240 companies in the medtech space a few years ago it's with uh, Stanford Professor Josh Mackauer, uh, where I live, Josh went ahead and surveyed all our companies and, and realized that we got nine months uh, of the typical elapsed time from filing um, approval for the FDA to get some action 
whereas in, if you looked at the, the 11 months was the time from first filing the CE mark application in Europe to approval. So you see this, this here and you say 54 months versus 11 months here. If you look at you know, a million dollar a month burn rate for a med tech company here and you've got a 54 month outcome on average compared to 11 months, you end up gravitating towards Europe as a result of this mess here. You just can't afford to, to finance it any other way. So we believe as industry that we should act now to uh, maintain a leadership position. I don't like going to Columbia, South America to do our first in man for Aegis, but we have to do that, or, or Toronto, Canada, uh, to survive. We've got to show human data to get the corporates to give us money to, to successfully grow our business. If we could do that here like we did in the 80s, it would be great. So we think the government now is listening to us, but it's, again, it's a very slow process to change the behavior here. Um, there are a lot fewer venture capital groups in America than there were back in the heyday in 2000, uh, about a third. If you look at the 14 numbers, there's under 300 groups here. So the, the numbers of dollars are still there, but what they're doing is they're going towards non-healthcare uh, deals and they're going towards later stage. So what used to be venture capital, which was like series A or B, early stage, now is going to late stage when you're at iRhythm's point of being almost profitable. So this is a problem for our industry. The number of VC, VC firms in healthcare has gone down dramatically. The, the size has um, gone down. And if you look at the challenge from a, a macroeconomic standpoint, you've got a lot of companies that are, that are old, been around for like eight, nine, ten years. They're trying to find some way to exit. And you're competing against a very small number of acquirers that are getting smaller by the day. For instance, um, uh, Medtronic just uh, merged with Covidian in Ireland in the past three, four weeks. Well, that took away two buyers. Now we have one. And that's occurring a lot these days. Uh, in the last week, it was announced that, um, uh, that Soren is, is merging with Cyberonics in the neuromodulation space, again, taking two acquirers into one. So you, you now have the problem of number of acquirers getting smaller and number of, of uh, old deals are out there in uh, Death Valley, if you will, with nowhere to go. It's a very big problem for many of our companies. So I'm going to stop right there, and we can talk about some uh, questions uh, now about the, what I just presented, or I can go into this diatribe that I'm really excited about, which is uh, Aegis doing our first cases in America today. Yes. Yes, sir. Y yes. Uh, I have uh, a, a two-pointed question. Uh, don't you think that uh, FDA's problem uh, could be that they don't have enough engineers to uh, evaluate the medical devices, and maybe they have too many lawyers? <laughs> and don't you think uh, this business is, uh, is being inhibited from growing uh, because there are too many lawyers around and uh, engineers are not being allowed to do what they know how to do? Well, that's, that's a great question. Um, uh, I don't think the FDA hires lawyers, <laughs> but there are many out there that will pounce on a uh, case if they can get a, 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 you know, a judgment uh, that favors them. Um, they have a very generous budget. In fact, medical devices companies have been giving them money uh, to facilitate the transfer of uh, applications to, to a faster pace. Uh, the problem is, in my judgment, is that there's been a risk-averse averse, uh, philosophy in place now for about 10 years. And again, it's, when you start looking at the front page in the New York Times and there's a there was a classic case was in about 07, a, uh, a, a patient that had an implantable defibrillator from Guidant, now which is part of Boston Scientific, died uh, mountain biking in Utah. And he was in his 30s, and it was a, a defective lead for the device. Well, that, that appeared on the front page of the New York Times, and within months or weeks maybe, there was a congressional inquiry about this, and the FDA was front and center and being, you know, being questioned by a congressman about, about why they approved this faulty lead for, for guidance. And so, and that occurred just about a year after the, um, uh, there was a, um, a cancer drug that had a, uh, 
uh, adverse reaction for causing heart attacks. And that, that drug that appeared also in the, point, uh, the front page of the New York Times. So you start seeing that time and time again. So the FDA has natural proclivity to not approve anything, unless it's obvious in, y'all be obviously good in Europe. So that to me is the problem, not the lawyers. The lawyers are, we need tort reform from our, our standpoint. Because if you, if you have a product that's 99.9% um, .9 uh, you know, successful and you have 0.1% where it's not successful, and when that 0.1% can wreck the entire industry and the benefit, that's not, not a good thing for our public policy. That's not lawyers. The lawyers are just there. Yes? Just to follow up on that, uh, you mentioned the Kessler yes. fair. Was Kessler himself not both a lawyer and an MD, or am I mistaken him for another person? There was one of the FDA officials that was both MD and lawyer, right? Oh, that's, uh, that's uh, yes, you're, yeah, you're, you're that's thinking of Jeff Sheeran. Sure, he is a neurologist and a lawyer, correct, oh, Jeff Sheeran. Sure, that's where most of the program started, right? <laughs> yeah, he's a lawyer and a, and a neurologist. It's right. a bad combination. No, I'm not, it's, it's, <laughs> no he, actually, he's a good guy. He, he is behind this innovation change topic. Uh, I was very skeptical about Sheeran when he got, first got there at the FDA, but um, I've been, I've been a, a convert in the past year. He's actually trying real hard to make things better, okay. but he's a lawyer. My follow-up question is, are these bio companies moving overseas to evade taxes by, you know, making their headquarters? In a, I mean, you mentioned one of the companies that... Well, yeah, Medtronic and Convidian. Yeah. yeah. That's what they are trying to do, just like other companies are doing, move their headquarters overseas. So yeah. I've got, a, I've got a slide in my appendix that shows you the top ten acquirers right. and all the cash that they have, which is primarily overseas. It's like t trillions of dollars. Okay. So they um, will not bring it back into the U.S. because if they do, there'll be a 35% tax penalty for doing that that they would then pay and then reinvest in the U.S. So these companies that tell us, okay, we love Aegis, uh, we love Atrius and mitral valve disease, but you know, if you want us to invest in you and buy you later on a structured deal, do it outside the U.S. because we can do, therefore use euros to invest in you from our Irish coffers and we can buy you with euros. And that's about a 15 to 20 percent premium for the acquirer to do it in that way. So they're advising us to do it the way we're doing it. And I hate doing it, but you know what? We got to survive. Does, yes, Steve. Um, for the overseas uh, that, that's happening more now, yeah. do, how does that impact on future sales of those products? Let's say it succeeds and it yeah. does become approved and all that from the overseas uh, development uh, innovation. Then, then uh, how does that impact on the future use of that product by doctors in the U.S.? Can, can they just not sell it in the U.S.? Because they have well, that's, the they, yes, they, they can choose not to sell that. And I've, I've been around and boardrooms and big companies that having this discussion right now or even a year or two ago was should we be developing new technology for non-US markets and never in, in, and never include the US based on the financials. Um, but typically, like in the case of this biostent product here, it'll be approved, it's approved in 60 countries right now. It'll be the 61st will be the US in about five, six months. But it will get here eventually just a lot, lot later. And so what happens is I just had a friend of mine whose dad needs a coronary stent, he lives in Seattle. I've advised him to get in his car and drive to Vancouver to get this bio stent in the past two weeks. So lots of people are doing, they're going outside the U.S. to do, to have new technology such as stem cell therapy, for instance, outside the U.S. Is it true that the, the, all that patient data that comes from the outside the U.S. usages of these, will be considered by the FDA for a future. They're changing, they used, used not to want to do that. Now they're uh, very happy to use, if it's in a, in a, a very uh, scientific manner, they will accept it now. And that's again, one of their changes they made recently. But they used to not care about uh, non-US data. Yes, sir. Uh, since this is more or less a judgment call rather than a black, white engineering type question, right? Are you going to change the value, uh, value system of the Food and Drug Administration if they are risk averse? I mean, what, what do you? Well, you know, that's a great point. And uh, I'll give you an example of what happened. Uh, I showed you previously that TAVR was approved, what, in 2011? And I'll tell you exactly what happened. 
it was it wasn't um, so here um, in November of this was approved in eleven I believe I'll tell you what happened here we we were Taver was improved in all these countries outside the U.S. and um, on the um, second page of the Wall Street Journal was a mega article written by a who's who of cardiologists, scientific geniuses all over the country and the world, talking about because the FDA has not approved TAVR in the U.S., it's costing 10,000 lives per year of Americans dying. Well, guess what happened in two weeks? They approved it. So the scientific community up in arms and pissed off about this not being approved in the U.S., but everywhere else it was approved, they basically got an article, and that affected the FDA to, to, to make a change. But it takes that kind of thing to get them moving. Hammer. Yeah, and, and, they, and, and they've gotten a lot better since then. But this is, this is a case, this is a textbook case study about why, why we should not be so conservative at the FDA when we have people dying in America. They're denied therapy that's world-class. World it's available everywhere else in the world. You can go to you can go to you can go to uh, Albania. I mean, isn't that ridiculous? We're we're right there by Al Albania getting approvals. Yeah. So um, when you look at that, there's, there's another problem hidden in this, and that's uh, five years of exclusivity lost in the best market in the world. Uh, are the FDA reforms also considering some kind of patent relief forms? Reforms. That's that's independent. The patent the PTO the patent office is looking at. Um, patent reform right now and um, they're they're still in debate about what to do there it's not clear to us that it will be a good or bad thing they may make changes that are, that are bad for our industry well, I mean, there have been some <coughs> things in, in at least the pharmaceutical space where yes. review time has been credited that has happened in the device area as well. So they will basically take the, say, say it took you four years to get approval, they will add that to the 17 and a half year life of the uh, first to file date. So it give you a longer tail end of the patent life. Is that a review or real time is counted? Um, they, I think they, I'm not sure, but I think they look at uh, time of the uh, investigational device issuance until the pre-market approval issuance, that entire time they will credit you for exclusiveness on your, on your IP. Yeah. Excuse me. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Oh, uh, yes, sir, thank you. Um, could you expand a little bit on why Ireland specifically? <laughs> yeah, um, well, they, they like Americans. They like to drink. <laughs> they like to play golf. <laughs> they love music. Uh, Ireland has a 12... 12.5% is their tax rate. And uh, if you also put a company in Ireland, we've done three of those now, what ha will happen is the, um, they have two governing bodies that uh, will give you uh, early stage uh, funding and some tax benefits beyond that. So if you were, for instance, to put a million dollars into R&D, like we're doing now at Aegis, uh, a year, they'll write you a check for half that amount the next year and just give it to you as a gift. So it's, it's amazingly their incentives are, are, are so strongly, um, they're so different than American disincentives. They have the uh, 180 degree opposite way to incent you to come there. Yes, behind you. Uh, wait, isn't that true that a lot of the underlying fundamental research comes from the U.S. taxpayer? Yes. And so, you know, you would expect that uh, <coughs> to be to give a little bit more back than a place that just gets employment and manufacturing benefits like maybe Ireland, where all of that fundamental research will not go with their taxpayers. Yeah, you're right. You know, the, the NIH does a huge amount of benefit to our, to our industry by funding early stage basic research. You're, you're right. And that's our, that's our taxpayer money. You're right. And, and so the case on how it's been covered, which, is, which would explain the differential tax rate. I can see a point about corporate reform, but I don't see a point about tax rates. I don't see any of the big companies points about tax rates. Tax well, um, you've seen uh, examples here, and I mean, I've, there, there have been uh, this. One that I just talked about last, that happened last week with Cybronics, which is a Houston-based neuromodulation company 
merging with an Italian company in a pacemaker business, and they're going to end up as a UK company here. They're doing that for tax reasons, the same way that Medtronic is using the in inversion of um, Covidian to be a now Dublin, Ireland-based company here. And what Medtronic has said publicly is that they're going to take, now that, now that they're uh, Irish dominate, uh, the domicile, they, they can now make direct investments in the U.S. with their euros and invest in U.S. R&D. So, yeah. Yes. I know some people may have a class, so I want to... Is it time to go? No, not yet. We're going to stay here. We're going to definitely stay till 12.15 in this room, so we don't okay. need to go. But I do want to thank Dr. Steve Nicely and the Chemical, Biological, and Bioengineering Department for hosting and inviting Bill Starling. And just w join me in thanking Bill Starling for being here. But we're not going anywhere. Well, it's always good to be here in North Carolina. I, I love this place. And I, I can't get enough of it. So. Uh, I have uh, before the students go. Yes. Uh, uh, m most of them are engineers, yes. uh, all the students, and uh, in your experience, uh, which discipline has helped you come up with the uh, medical devices? Um, and how would you uh, Yeah, well, them? you know, I, I, engineering students um, are um, absolutely required engineering prowess to be successful in my business here. I've always found that uh, as a non-technical person, um, I've been able to benefit from being able to know thought leaders in the space and cardiovascular disease, combined with an, an invention person, a cardiac cardiologist. Yeah, so, so basically, the th there are three parts of this. is, is great engineering skill, well, in, first is invention which may or may not be engineering based, could be clinical based. Then there's, there's engineering taking the ideas and making them manufacturable and proprietary. That's very, absolutely required. And then uh, the guys like me, the business guys that can deal with thought leaders and figure out is there really a big, more, is, there, is there an i-rhythm type of opportunity here? And being able to have the, the vision. So it's, it's invention, it's engineering discipline and proprietary invention. And then there's the, the, the vision, the unmet need. So to me, they're all three intertwined. So engineering is, is one third of the stool, if you will, of success in, in my business. And in terms of disciplines, I mean, material sciences have been a huge part of what has made cardiology successful. I mean, you know, there's, there's double E's important for implantable defibrillators and software. But I mean, if you look at terms of material science, it's had the biggest contribution to cardiovascular innovation in the past three decades. Yes, Steve. In the, uh, with regard to the FDA, yeah. one, one of the uh, criteria, I guess, or the issues that, uh, at least according to the textbook, gets addressed in an innovation uh, project is the uh, uh, regulatory issue. Mm -hmm. And you have these different pro pathways, the 510K and the PMA. Yeah. Now, with regard to the problem that they're having with the FDA, is it mostly for PMA-type applications, or the 510K is also affected? Well, uh, Find those terms for the audience. Uh, yeah, the 510K is the briefer one where there's already a substantially equivalent technology that is being used, whereas the pre-market approval is more of a higher risk technology and implantable device that might uh, not have, uh, it will require clinical trials to get through a lot more time. Yeah, so you're looking at, so that's a great question, Steve, and a year ago it would have given a different answer, but the 510Ks, the shorter pathway has have gotten a lot more predictable in the past six to nine months. Uh, the, he just got their approval two months ago, and it was very predictable from the July filing. Uh, the pre-market approvals, the longer clinical trial, um, more difficult pathways have not changed much. They're still a little bit unpredictable and very long. But for the shorter pathways, they've gotten a lot better in recent recent year. And I think a lot of that, that's due to the management of the FDA is realizing the innovation is leaving the country. So they're starting with the easier part of the, that problem, which is the 510K pathway, to, to fix that first, and then the PMA, I hope, will come down the road later. So, and you mentioned that, uh, for example, health IT yes. is not so much impeded by the FDA. Right. I guess that's because it's low-risk devices. Right. So 
people don't die typically if you, you know, if your app that tells your heart rate's wrong, you know. Yeah, right. Right. So, is it, from the standpoint of say engineers who are interested in the space, when we think about which kind of inventions or ideas for innovations that be worth, worth spending effort on, should we be focusing, in your opinion, on the uh, on some of the less invasive ones, or the ones that would be low risk, the ones that would be IT or other non-risk uh, type technology? Well, yes and no. I mean, uh, in terms of uh, business success probability, that's correct. You should focus on the lower risk ones that are don't need much capital and can get to uh, the public quickly and cheaply. But if you're looking at the big unmet needs, I mean, uh, cancer, diabetes, these are big, big problems. I mean, you would like to have some cure for these horribly, horrible diseases, but you're talking now about decades of funding and, and a little bit of luck too. So you can't, if I had a, if I had a cure for death today and was a PMA, I couldn't get funding from, because of the uh, FDA. I, can, I could not, ACS, Metrotex, Cardiac Pathways, all three PMAs, I could never get Series A raised today in today's environment. And it's sad. So I'm doing Aegis, which is done with seed capital, our own money, and virtual company, and we don't have any employees. And, and, and hours based. I have one other question. You made a comment about the overseas companies, uh, like the one you mentioned that has no employees but contracts. Yeah. Let's say you have an overseas company in Ireland and you have contracts. Can they be U.S. contracts? Yes, of course. We, 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 we in effect, we, we don't employ, but we, we, we pay monthly stipends to about six people in RTP right now. And our contract, our contract manufacturer is in Franklin County near, near Raleigh that makes our devices. Um, we, our regulatory consultant is in, we got one in Paris and we got one in, uh, in Raleigh. Um, our FDA lawyer is in Washington, D.C. These are all people that we, we pay every month bills and we in fact fund their lifestyles, but they're not employees. But we are in fact creating you know, monetary wealth in, in the U.S. But our IP is in Ireland. There's a question over. Yes, ma'am. Uh, so, so question um, about the stipends. Are they paying taxes on the stipends? Of course, yes. My, my son is one of the employees. Well, he's, not, he's a contractor. He's paying, he's paying taxes on that. And then one, one other issue that I wanted to raise. Um, yes. Um, so what do you say to people like me? I used to work for the Consumer Product Safety Commission. Okay. Which makes me somewhat risk averse when it comes to American lives. Sure. Um, the trade-off has to be made, right, between very careful reviews and at the same time, uh, you know, approving products and approving uh, uh, drugs, et cetera, so that they can be released into the market. Yes. Given the fact that we, we have this strong value on American lives, what do you say to a person like me or anybody else who might have the same concerns uh, that, uh, about why it sounds reasonable to go to another country where, yes, they have lower regulations, but they take much more risks with the lives of their citizens? Like Columbia. Yeah. Well, okay. Um, the the center we went to in Cali, Colombia, for our first four uh, uses of our Aegis device, uh, it is a world class center uh, trained by the University of Miami uh, cardiology department. These are people you we would we would have our parents go there for a procedure. There's no question about it. They are as good as anywhere in, in America. And they allow us to bring our doctors there who invented the stuff to do the procedures. So we have the best people in the world that invented it doing cases on their patients and they're scrubbing with us. So, But yeah, we, we, we never, ever, ever do something in humans that we would not have performed our parents. Never. Are there any student questions? Hi, Beth. How yeah. are you? Yes. Thank How you so you? much for, for coming today. Pleasure I really enjoyed your talk. Um, I have a question from a student standpoint, uh, and I guess it's more of a how-to asking for your advice. Uh, I'm definitely interested in becoming an entrepreneur, um, and, and I, I have a passion for research. I would like to invent something that's going to change the world, but also, of course, be profitable. Um, from a student standpoint, uh, what type of advice would you give to someone who is interested in potentially following in your footsteps? Yeah, the, the best pathway, I think, right now for students, and I, 
I, I give talks frequently at UNC, Duke, um, Stanford, uh, last month, Illinois, two months ago at Illinois, but this is the same, the same question always comes up, and I would say that uh, get somebody, find somebody like me that could get you in an internship during the summer in a, in a start, startup company here. You can see how it works. And don't worry about getting paid or not. Just go for the experience. And, you know, like I've got, I've got one, uh, one of my colleague's daughter is an upcoming senior at UNC in the biomedical engineering department. She, she's now trying to get a Silicon Valley summer experience. And I'm helping her with about five people trying to find her a job right now in San Francisco. So that kind of thing would, would change your life. But that's what I would recommend. Just to uh, add to what you just said, you just mentioned that material science had made yes. a lot of innovation. If you look at Hopkins, Stanford, all of them, if you look at the professors, the material science, they all have joint appointment. Yes. Which also the medical school. So yes. that also facilitates if you go to school where they have that kind of. That's right. Uh, that facilitates because your research is related. So you that's right. Yeah, joint. Yeah, 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 medicine and engineering right, uh, is, right. is very critically important, and Stanford does it really well. And that leads to this uh, critical question. In all these innovations, is it the MDs who are coming up with them, or is it the engineers who are driving them? It's a, it's, a it's a team. It's a team. It's a team. You can't, uh, doctors uh, cannot, uh, very, 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 very few can do engineering. <laughs> um, this guy, Tom Fogarty, is one of the rare exceptions. He does us at all, but most of the, the clinicians come up with the idea but they, they cannot reduce it to practice. Engineering help is required there, especially the manufacturability part of it. So it's, it's a team. Yeah, they, they usually have, like Hawkins have this nano biotechnology right. center directed by Peter Searson, and it's a material science. Yeah. They work with all the medical people too. Yeah. So, so I'm, I'm the third wheel in it. I'm, I'm the business guy. I mean, I started out in sales. I mean, my first job out of business school was selling heart valves at cardiac surgeons in Wisconsin. You know? <laughs> so. You know, hell, I didn't know a damn thing about heart valves when I got my MBA, but then it changed. And I, but I was able to, because I was a southerner living in Wisconsin and kind of an anomaly by definition via Southern California, I was kind of like this oddball that people liked. And so I got to be, I was very successful as a sales guy, but getting into marketing was, after two years of that, was what made my, um, my career was I got involved with angioplasty at the very beginning. And I work with the world's best thought leaders uh, about what's going to happen in the future. So the, the vision of the future, the, the invention, and the engineering, it's all one. It's a three-party three solution. All three people. Yes? Can you share a little bit about how you're making decisions of this is a company we want to invest in and really move to the next level? Or, yeah. you know what, my time to be at this company has shifted because you're actually, the fun part for you is this. Unveil that a little bit for us. Yeah, well, it's really uh, a great question because um, you're really following the dollars, you know. So, so we, we now look at a, like a, like a cool idea like iRhythm. I mean, we didn't do it back in 06 because the reimbursement wasn't first and foremost. But now we look at, okay, Blue Cross Blue Shield, North Carolina, which is one of my investors in my venture fund. Let's to conceive of something five years from now that they're being asked to pay for and work backwards from there. So will they, will they pay for the Aegis device for $9,000? And the answer is, if you can shorten your hospital stay from 10 days to two days, yes. So therefore, we fund a cost effectiveness study now when we're doing our first human cases to show that Compared to historical standards with open heart surgery, you can reduce the cost even with our expensive gizmo from $75,000 to $30,000. And you go to the, the, the payers, do you buy this? And they say, I want, I want peer reviewed and published, and yes, I will buy this. So you work backwards from that. Yeah, yeah. But that five years ago, I didn't, didn't do that. Now I am. Yes. I have a question, and this is from a faculty point of view. Yes. I'm sure you know we in the universities have access to a lot of equipment grants, very expensive equipment, and I'm sure we have expertise that can benefit the form by yours. Why aren't medtechs more interested in working directly with universities as, as opposed to these consultants that you mentioned? 
what are the challenges you may face, for example, to come into a university? Well, um, we, my, uh, my experience is that we need to come to universities uh, for clinical uh, advice and invention. So of those 10 companies that Cinecor has, oh, I've started 10 and a half companies, if you will, uh, every single one had a, um, was, a, was a professor at Stanford, Duke, or UNC. And they were, they were part of the initial IP. But from an engineering standpoint, um, although Stanford is in our backyard, um, it's just a lot di difficult, more difficult to deal with tech transfer, uh, typically, and uh, the, the conflict of interest problems that you often find in university settings. So by the time you get through all this, it's a year later, and why, why bother? Versus taking a university professor's, I'm not sure how it is here at A&T, but at Duke and UNC and Stanford, You've got one day a week you can be uh, a solo practitioner and do what you want to do. As long as you don't use anything from the university, you can invent on your own and do a deal with a private company. So we see a lot of that going on. But not, not engineering type work because you can do that with a contract manufacturer like this without any, any paperwork and rigmarole. Anybody else? I have a question. Oh, yes, sir. Um, I was wondering, does one have to work, like myself, a student, does one have to work outside of the U.S. in order to be on the forefront no. of medical innovative technology? You can do it right here in Greensboro. You sure can. Uh, the best ideas will are American ideas, and there will always be American ideas in medtech. I'm, I'm almost certain of that. It's a matter of how do you, how do you get it financed in a capital-efficient way in this difficult environment. But I guarantee you that the American ideas will prevail the next many decades, the rest of my life, certainly, for I mean, MedTech. Yes. Any other questions? Well, once again, please join me in Okay, thank you. Thank you.